Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the My name is Guy McInnes, St. Bernard Parish President, a place where the War of 1812 was fought and ended here with Andrew Jackson at the command. It's one of the most significant battles in our country's history. Um, without the win here at the Battle of New Orleans, what would have happened with the Western expansion of the United States of America? Right here on the plains of St. Bernard Parish, People from all groups, all colors, all races fought together for one cause. And look what we have today, this great nation, um, the United States of America. So we're so excited to celebrate um, this occasion, um, this event. We don't glorify the war. We want to educate and we want to teach so that we can save future lives from future wars. So here in St. Bernard Parish, it's so much um, a part of our history. Um, we make sure that we give it um, all that we can every year to recognize um, the sacrifice of all of those people way back on January 8th, 1815. So with that said, uh, I am so proud and honored to introduce to you our Lieutenant Governor, who has been um, a mainstay here, if you will, um, for this celebration every year, um, Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser. Hi, this is Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser of the great state of Louisiana. Louisiana is so rich with history, from the World Heritage Site, Poverty Point, up in the northeast corner, to the many battlefields and forts around Louisiana. St. Bernard is home to one of the world's most important battlefields where one of the greatest powers was defeated right here in Louisiana. The one-sided American victory changed the way Americans saw themselves and the way Great Britain saw Americans. Very few military engagements had the long-lasting effect as the Battle of New Orleans did. The Chalmette Battlefield is a very special place that all students across this country should visit and learn the history there. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Nungesser and Parish President McGinnis. My name is Chuck Hunt. I'm the superintendent of Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve, which includes the Chalmette Battlefield and the Chalmette National Cemetery. Although we are remote in a way, uh, as we commemorate the Battle of New Orleans this year, its meaning is more pertinent than ever. 206 years ago today, like many other times in history, men and women of all backgrounds sacrificed their time, resources, and lives to fight for something that they believed in. We do not commemorate this battle to showcase the winner. We commemorate this battle to remember the sacrifice needed to create the world in which we want to live. United States fought here against Great Britain, but today they're one of our closest allies. 
change does not come quickly, but by remembering events like this, we're reminded that change is possible. We're coming together this year while staying apart. And while we cannot see everyone in person, and while we cannot feel the energy of thousands of people on this battlefield, we still honor the sacrifice of all involved in this battle. We're proud to protect not only the battlefield on which this event occurred, but a national cemetery that protects those who protected us in wars across the centuries. I now lay a wreath on behalf of all of us to commemorate those who fought on January 8th, 1815, and all who were affected by the battle and the war. For all our partners, veterans, and groups that commemorate this event with us this, every year, we feel your presence with us this year as well. On behalf of the National Park Service, thank you for your continued involvement in preserving the history of the Battle of New Orleans. We hope to see everyone here in person on January 8th, 2022. Thank you. We're gonna stand here, we're gonna defend it, or we're we gonna die on the spot. The guys are a little bit on edge. They are aware that the attack is imminent. His battle plan was amazingly simple, but amazingly wise. Standing on a battle line with cannonballs and musket balls firing, and just to have that conviction to stand there and fight, Hi, my name is Kim Acker. We are here at Chalmette Battlefield and National Cemetery in Chalmette, Louisiana. This battlefield looks a lot different than it did on January 8th, 1815. Today, Chalmette Battlefield and National Cemetery is administered by the National Park Service as part of Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve. This place serves as a monument to the Battle of New Orleans, which took place here over 200 years ago. Over the next several videos, we'll explore the battle virtually what led to the conflict, what life was like for the soldiers who fought here, and their families back home. And finally, we'll see what some of the weapons were like in 1815 and shoot off some cannons and muskets. On behalf of the National Park Service, welcome to Virtual Battle of New Orleans. Before we get into the details of the battle, we have to understand how this conflict arose to begin with. Who was involved? Why were we here? To set the scene, the Battle of New Orleans was part of the War of 1812 between the United States and Great Britain. Now, New Orleans itself was only acquired by the United States about a decade earlier, in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. 
Well, the cause of the War of 1812 actually began at the end of the Revolutionary War because Britain never really completely honored the terms of the peace settlement there. Um, so they were still holding territories that they should have reseded back to the United States. Up in New England, at the time, because of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, Great Britain and uh, France were at war and they embargoed the other country's products. So up in New England, where it was important, they couldn't sail to anywhere. The United States and Great Britain are disagreeing over several issues. The major one is what we call impressment, which means that British soldiers were jumping ship and joining the American Navy. So they would stop an American merchant ship and they would line the guys up and they would look for British deserters. The problem was their criterion for being a British subject was generally of the form you spoke English. The United States took a very dim view of that. On the western part of the country, Ohio, Indiana, the British were given incentives to the Indians to attack the Americans in their western progress, give them guns and money and things like that. There was also you know, some other things that Britain was doing that just really showed that they had little regard for the fact that we were an independent nation. And of course, in the south, we had the embargo given problems to this people shipping out of New Orleans. There were also some economic issues. So all of those things led up to the declaring of war by Congress under James Madison. The first set of troops arrives in Washington, D.C. First two years are mostly along the Canadian border. So for most folks down in New Orleans, that wouldn't really have impacted them that much directly. They would have felt the pinch of any British blockade, but direct fighting, it'd just be newspaper accounts. The tide began to turn a little bit with the Battle of Fort McHenry when they withstood the bombardment, just the barrage of armament that was dumped on that fort for hours upon hours upon hours, and they stood. And of course, that's when Francis Scott Key was on a boat outside in the harbor and saw the flag still standing. And that's where we get the Star Spangled Banner. The British then go to Bermuda to resupply. They go down to Jamaica to find more troops. And then the British came down here and they're gonna fight along the Gulf Coast. So there's gonna be a battle in Mobile and then they're gonna come over here to New Orleans. Because New Orleans is one of the busiest ports in the world at this time. And as America is expanding secondary to the Louisiana Purchase, the British are pretty convinced they could pretty much destroy our economy. The course of the war eventually led an unlikely duo, future President Andrew Jackson and the pirate Jean Lafitte, to both work and protect the city of New Orleans. But why was it important? The Americans are led by Andrew Jackson. He is a seasoned commander. He was a, a militia general uh, fighting mostly with Tennesseans. He had fought some battles against the Indians in Florida, some of which were sanctioned by the Secretary of War and some of which were not. Uh, at that point in time, he was promoted to a general in the regular army uh, with aim of defending the Gulf Coast. He actually had a strong dislike for the British. He blamed them for the death of his mother and his brother during the Revolutionary War. So after he got word something was gonna happen down here, he went to Mobile, protected Mobile to where the British couldn't get it. He went to Pensacola, a Spanish colony, and made sure that the British couldn't come through Pensacola. And about this time, he heard about the attack coming on New Orleans. And so he boogied to New Orleans to get here to be sure New Orleans was protected. Uh, John Lafitte was a pirate, and then he went privateer because he got a letter of mark. Which is permission from one government to attack and plunder the ships of a government the first government is at war in. But he wasn't too particular. He did attack mostly non-American ships, so therefore he was called a, a pirate. And he sells whatever he finds. Now, because there's an embargo as a result of all the wars in Europe, the people of New Orleans and the Southeast don't have a lot of things, so they're willing to pay top dollar to John Lafitte to get whatever it is he finds on a ship. And to be honest with you, that can be anything from linen to plates to liquor to slaves. The British thought they could get through Barataria. At that point in time, it's just a marsh, swamp, cypress trees, some solid ground, some not. They really didn't know if they would be able to do it, but they did know that Jean Lafitte could do it. The British knew that if they were gonna attack New Orleans, they'd have to cross some sort of waterway. And when they got here, they had to say how they're gonna come. And that's when everything started to get interesting. Mr. Lafitte is approached 
because he has knowledge of the area and also has a base at the base of Barataria Bay, just west of New Orleans, that the British could use to come up a canal or a bayou and come down the Mississippi towards New Orleans from the back way. They tried to get a deal with Jean Lafitte, saying, hey, we'll make you a captain in our Navy. We'll give you a ship. We'll let you give you a complete amnesty from everything. Just show us how to get to New Orleans. Mr. Lafitte declines the offer. So I think what he realizes, the British will probably put him out of business as soon as they take command. He wants nothing to do with them. Jackson called Lafitte hellish banditti until he found out that Lafitte had two things that Jackson needed and didn't have enough of, gunpowder and rifle flints. We need his flints, we need his gunpowder, plus he's got a crew that's, that's willing to help. All we have to do is give him amnesty. Because of the water situation, the British are forced to come in by a rowboat. They come in about six to seven miles from this location. They also attempt to take over plantations. They take over one specific plantation. The owner's son jumps out the back door and warns General Jackson that the British have actually landed. Jackson orders an immediate attack. It happens on the 23rd of December, and it is a night attack by U.S. forces, the attack is called off because it's so dark, no one knows who's shooting at who, doing what. Now, General Jackson has also brought the USS Carolina and the USS Louisiana up the river, and they begin to fire on the British with their cannons. They are fairly successful in disrupting the British activities. The general comes pretty much to the very spot we're standing right now. The person who controlled New Orleans controlled two-thirds of the land of what would become the United States. If you claim the Mississippi, you've really cut off a major shipping component for the Western colonies in the United States. They wanted to keep America from expanding across the Mississippi. The only way they could do that is to control New Orleans. So they wanted to capture New Orleans so they can put those guns on the fort to say, okay, guys, we're in charge now. In the years, months, and even days leading up to January 8th, 1815, it was impossible to predict exactly how the Battle of New Orleans would unfold, despite the best laid plans of both sides. In the preceding weeks, the conflict had already taken some unexpected turns, and a treaty to end the war had already been signed. But no one could have predicted the lasting effects that this last battle would have on the city, its people, and key players like Andrew Jackson and Jean Lafitte. But regardless of any national or international implications of a war, every battle is significant to those who are there fighting. Next, we'll see what life was like for the soldiers in the field the day before the battle. In the centuries after a battle, we might remember key players, dates, locations, but we don't always remember that these battles are fought by hundreds, thousands of individuals laying down their lives for the greater cause. So who were the people in the Battle of New Orleans? What was life like as a soldier? And did they believe in the cause? It was a very cold winter here in the area. It was just a tough, tough life. I'd say low 30s in the day, the sun goes down, the wind house is gonna drip below freezing. Because of the amount of water we have results in a very damp, wet, cold. It's also raining to the point of sleet. And what the troops are forced to do is to live in conditions that are pretty bad because there's no way to dry up and get warm. When Jackson first got to New Orleans, he had 1,000 troops. He had about 600 with him, and there were about 400 in the area in the forts. So that's the regular army. He immediately called on the governor and his friends in Tennessee and Kentucky to send some of their reserves here. Two groups who come from Tennessee 
They are militia, but they have fought with General Jackson several other times and are familiar with him and feel very comfortable with him. We also received at least one group of Kentuckians who came and had to take a boat and walk to get here. You have to understand, we don't have at this point in the United States a large standing army, and most of what we have is in the East. So there are local militias who are trained to fight and protect their local areas. At your best, you have some of the uniform, the militia units, not a professional soldier, but they actually know how to point, shoot, and follow orders. Some of the militias were very good, some were not. Some arrived with weapons, some did not. At your lowest, you have a local Louisiana Conscript Militia Unit. This is their first time in any type of combat. You had the pirates who had experience with combat, but mostly on the water and not on the land. And then there was all the hunters that had guns that knew how to use them, so they were kind of skilled too. We have the Choctaw Indians who have come. And then you had some of the free colored troops. And there are two battalions, all of them hoping for citizenship. But knowing that that force was going to be vastly outnumbered by the British Army, he had to go and recruit and raise the locals to fill out the ranks and have a, a stronger fighting force to take on the British. And to a certain extent, didn't give the, the residents of New Orleans much of a choice. He told them, you're going to come fight. This is your city. You're going to defend it. The camps start to be set up as soon as Jackson realizes the British are coming. When he came into New Orleans, just was a very dynamic individual just had a way to rally the men. Within the city of New Orleans itself, there was a lot of complaint because he placed martial law upon the city. Jackson was not always popular with his troops, although they liked his command style. He was a soldier's general rather than an administration general. When the battle's going on, General Jackson's out there with them. He knew what he was doing. He knew what his limits were. He knew how to find people he could depend on and he managed to get a bunch of people who weren't always friendly or cooperative to work together. A lot of the camp followers were the wives of enlisted men and officers, so they would stay with them. And what they would do is they were paid by the army or the group to cook and clean for the soldiers. Since Chalmette is very close to New Orleans, only about six miles, they very easily had food clothes, all kinds of things transported to them. Here, they would have lived pretty much like the soldiers would have because they were in tents. The women especially supported them, working as laundresses, seamstresses, nurses, all of the support that they would need during the battle. A lot of them were people who lived in the city of New Orleans. In fact, the Americans are getting a hot meal every day. And when you have a hot meal, your motivation goes way up. So they're vital. They're absolutely required. They probably didn't have some better food, some better provisions, but this is still not the way they want to spend their holidays, camped out in a field in the cold. Cold, rainy, wet, and because General Jackson is aware they're going to attack very soon, the guys are a little bit on edge. They are aware that the attack is imminent. But then when the privateers showed up with the powder and the flintlocks and the extra cannoneers, they were a hoop hoop huzzah. They've had a couple scrapes with the British before. There's been a night battle. There's been reconnaissance. They've been exchanging fire. So the Americans have fought the British on some smaller engagements during this campaign. And we've come out. It's been a draw. We pushed them back. So morale from that would be high because you've met the enemy. You haven't ran away yet. Life as a soldier was not easy. But here in the American camps, it was a little bit easier. You had families that would come and visit for the day. You had plenty of food. For weeks, these camps were set up prior to the Battle of New Orleans. Any supplies that they needed, more food, more materials, New Orleans is only six miles away. The United States was the home team. But what was life like in the camps for the British? The British soldiers are much more disciplined. They're trained. They're familiar with battle, they know what to do, they follow orders. You have some units that saw combat in the Napoleonic Wars. You have some units that, yes, they're professionals, but these guys have been on you know, garrison duty for most of the past couple of years. Now in the Caribbean, when, before they're in New Orleans, it's wonderful. The accounts are, it's too bloody hot down here. But as they come into Louisiana, the climate's going to change. That really wet cold that sinks into your bones, you can't get warm. And the British, of course, couldn't really have fires because that's how the Americans would see them and shoot them. 
So during that whole journey from getting off the ship, which is anchored off in the Gulf of Mexico, to rowing to camping, you're basically exposed to the elements for the vast majority of the British soldiers. So the British, in contrast, were completely stranded. They had what they could carry with them off of their boats. They were not eating a whole lot. In fact, their Christmas dinner was a biscuit about this big and about that much rum very little rations. They were running out. They were getting hungry and they were getting desperate. By January 8th, they're getting a little tired of standing out there getting cold, wet, and not eating. So part of General Packingham's decision is based on the fact his troops are not happy with him. They probably attacked with about 6,000 men. After the battle, the casualty rate was about 2,000 on the British side. 300 dead, the rest of them were either captured or wounded. The Americans, the number varies, but usually it's a neighborhood that's under 20. When you talk about the battle that was in Lake Bourne and a couple other events, the Americans lost maybe 300 all told. 200 years after the fact, we don't just focus on which side won a battle, won a war. We reflect on the effects that it had on the country, community, and individuals. Life as a soldier was tough. You had to truly believe in the cause you were fighting for or else have some other strong reason for being here. It wasn't just enlisted men who were fighting. Freemen of color, pirates, and probably a few women in disguise were on this battlefield. And if we think again of wars and battles today, we know that for every soldier on the field and for everyone that doesn't make it back, there's a family and community back home just as invested in the war effort. And whether in New Orleans or out in the country, a working class life in the 1800s was no easy life either. We'll find out what life was like in rural Louisiana next. Welcome to rural Louisiana, circa 1800. During this century, homes will start to be electrified. Indoor plumbing will become commonplace, but that's mostly gonna be in the cities and not until later in the century. During the time of the War of 1812, rural Louisiana was, well, let's just find out. Well, Southern Louisiana um, is a little different from the rest of the South when you think about especially the early 1800s. We don't become part of America until 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. You're looking at a lot of upheaval just from this transition from being a French and Spanish colony, being incorporated into America, a whole new culture, political system, introduction to new religion, whereas the French and Spanish are a heavy Catholic religion. You go to the Americans, very strong Protestant. We've also always been a bit more multicultural than some of the other colonies in that we had French, Spanish, Irish, German, um, and all of those societies intermingled in what, what became the Creole culture. Probably outside the city in the rural areas was a lot tougher. In the cities, you had more people and you had more resources. Uh, you know, you had stores, you had places you could ship out your products and all that you, and things you could bring there to sell. When you're out in the wilderness trying to scratch a living, you're making everything and doing everything on your own. It was very seldom that you actually made trips to the town to get things. Almost seems like the frontier, um, kind of, especially here in Louisiana, you kind of feel like you're on the southern edge of the known world. Most cities have no sewage system. Most cities have no clean water supply. Most cities have little policing or law enforcement. If you're living out away from the city, you know, everything is, you know, you're relying on yourself for survival, growing your own crops, hunting, um, and providing goods for yourself, whether you have to make certain tools, foods, clothing, and stuff like that. In the 1800s, there were different classes of people. At the top of that sphere, you do have your plantation owners. Only a small percentage of the population, maybe 5%, owned 
plantations back in those days. They're the people that had the money and the resources to be able to import goods from Europe or from New York or Philadelphia. They're the ones that live a much better lifestyle. They have more food, they have more clothing, they live in a grander house. What we would call now the middle class is really more the merchant class. So those are the shopkeepers and the people that run small business and, this, and those types of people. Um, in that class, there are both whites and there are free people of color because uh, a large percent of, of our population in the early 1800s are free people of color. Uh, so they own businesses, they operate in society just the way the white people do. As a blacksmith, where do you kind of rank on the, the hierarchy of you know life in the 1800s? I wouldn't be in the aristocratic area, which is gonna be the top echelon. I would be in the craftsman, which is one or two steps down. You might have the wealthy merchants a little above me, but then you have the craftsmen, which it could be everything from a blacksmith to a tinsmith, silversmiths, any of those carpenters, any of those trades are going to be probably about middle class. And then at the bottom of that culture are your slaves. in the upper hierarchy of the slave community, she or he, typically it's a woman, but it could be a, a man on some plantations. It's considered more of a refined worker, that upper class, a skilled worker. So she's gonna actually be training other people. Uh, so as she ages, there's someone that can take over for her. Um, she is gonna be an expensive slave to purchase for that owner. So he only wants to make that purchase if possible once, you know, so they're gonna be a, what we would call a sous chef in here oftentimes working with them. And one interesting story from the Battle of New Orleans is, a, is an individual named Jordan Noble. He was 14 years old when he joined the army. He was born enslaved in Georgia. His mom and him moved to New Orleans around 1811, 1812. He joins the army and was a drummer boy during the Battle of New Orleans and afterwards was able to get his freedom and served out in numerous wars after the War of 1812. Who did go to the war effort? I mean, was it people from every class? It was every class and any man of fighting age. Even if he didn't really want to do it, they would have probably coaxed him into getting onto that line to help protect the city. Just a great, great cross-section of New Orleans society. Like, from top to bottom, it was represented in Jackson's army at New Orleans. Plaché's battalion of uniformed officers, they are French-speaking individuals. They are usually quite wealthy, and they want to protect their investment. There was an organized free people of color militia in the city. When Jackson first got here, they were the best turned out militia that was here. Now, the overall command was given to a white man, but blacks were given the non-com and other commands. First time in American history that the blacks were allowed upper ranks. We have Jean Lafitte's group, and their goal for some of them is to receive citizenship and probably to get the British out of here so they can continue their trade. So for the War of 1812, I, I take it blacksmiths play a crucial role. They would have probably been repairing guns. They could have been making some of the canister shot. Blacksmiths kept everything, so they had all little bits and pieces of junk, and they could stuff that into a can and they could use that for canister shot for when the troops got close. You got that big shotgun spray of metal that went out, shrapnels. Everything that you need to get that has to deal with metal is more than likely gonna come from a blacksmith. So, you know, here at the Rural Life Museum and I'm from Shawmet Battlefield National Cemetery, you know, why do you think we need to protect places like this and, and have these places to learn about our history? A lot of people find history interesting. It's good to have it preserved for them to come out and visit, but you're also learning the old ways you get to see where you came from. Because if you don't know where you came from, it's kind of hard to find out which way you're going. Could you live without electricity, without running water? Some might call it the simple life, but it was the only life for rural Louisiana. As far as the city of New Orleans, it was all about the ports for international trading and the waterways, those iconic Louisiana bayous, which played a significant role in the Battle of New Orleans. So the players are on scene, geography has set the stage. It's time to find out how good old fashioned black powder finishes our story of the Battle of New Orleans.
January 8th, 1815, approximately five o'clock in the morning. Dark and a heavy fog blanketed what was about to become a battlefield. The core of the fighting would last only 30 minutes, but in the end, over 2,000 casualties. The damage is done by the black powder, cannons, and muskets, and it starts with a word, fire. It's middle of December, the British have arrived off in the Gulf, and they're going to aim for New Orleans. When the British came up those canals and settled a mile and a half from up here, they stopped. That's a key moment that they stopped because that day, Jackson got word that they were here. He immediately said, we're gonna attack them tonight. We're not gonna give them a chance to get rested. And he was doing well until more British showed up, and so he, he formed a retreat up to this spot. Now, this spot was known for a long time as far as a good defensive perimeter. On one side, you can't go up the river. Approximately a mile and a half to our north is where the swamp was. So they could not bring an army through there. New Orleans happens to be to my left, so if the British have to come, they have to come here. So Jackson got here and said, this is where we're gonna make our stand. His battle plan was amazingly simple, but amazingly wise. He basically constructed a huge rampart. The British gave the Americans a long time to build these ramparts. And all that mud piled up on this side of the barricade. The net result is they're higher than the British and they're in a safe position. Jackson was also able to mount his cannon securely. And they lined up behind that rampart knowing the way the British fought. So what was the, kind of the difference in the tactics between the American side and the British side? The British have to get around the American position. The British try a variety of tactics to do this. British are pretty desperate, so they're throwing everything they can against all parts of the American line, trying to find a weakness. Prior to the Battle of New Orleans, England and Spain had been fighting Napoleon all across Europe. And the tactics of that time was you lined up great numbers of soldiers. There's gonna be one mass, you march forward, fire off all your muskets at once, and get one giant ball of lead going toward the enemy and follow that up with a bayonet charge. Trying to find some advantage, maneuvering your troops around the field. Americans have basically one goal in this battle, and that is to stop the British from getting past them. So their goal is to defend the line at all costs. We're gonna stand here, we're gonna defend it, or are we gonna die on the spot? And that's basically Jackson's belief, uh, strictly defensive. Can you tell us just about the actual battle and what ended up happening? On January 8th, the British situation had been getting pretty desperate. The British troops were low on food, the morale was starting to break. So their general, Edward Pakenham, launches a, the big attack. Early morning, just as the sun is about to come up, there's gonna be 1,400 men crossing the Mississippi to eventually take the American position on the other side. They didn't realize the river had a current, and the ship is actually dragged a mile down the river, so they have to walk another mile. By the time they do do that, the battle is over. When they're finding out that's going to be delayed. And essentially the British decision is, do we wait and we lose the element of, you know, that early morning semi-night, or do we just go ahead and launch the assault and pray the flanking attack crosses the river and actually hits its target? They don't really play much of a role in the battle because they don't get started in time. So that point is the British decide to an, for an assault. There are two lines of attack, one on the northern part, one on the southern part. The southern part, is actually a ruse. That's just to keep the Americans confused. The majority of the forces, though, attack right along the swamp. They're trying to get over the American line there. The Americans, they're standing behind this earthenwork that's several feet deep, and the British are simply marching down. The British will come within range of the American line. When you're all tense and you're ready to fire and you're going like this and then you hear bang, everybody's gonna bang. It was just a madhouse, everybody's shooting. Also, a lot of the people that came down here to fight were frontiersmen, so they were used to hunting and you know shooting from a long distance. So they had a little bit of an advantage in there, but basically the Americans just sat there and picked them off. General Packenham 
who is watching the battle, realizes that his order to bring up a ladder, which you would have used to get a hold of a rampart that's four feet tall, was not followed. He sent his troops up against the Americans and their cannons and their rifles and muskets, and they have no way of getting over the ramparts. Two of the cannons that were vital in this battle were served by Lafitte's men. And if you're on a boat trying to aim, and you're pitching and swaying, and you're trying to hit your mark with a cannon, but now you're on land, that cannon's not moving around, so you can bounce that ball off the ground and knock the lieutenant off his horse. And that's what they were doing. As the British got close to the rampart, the Americans merely took their weapons, leaned down, and fired at the British soldier kind of individually. So after about 20 minutes, and everybody like stood back and said, what the heck was that? Uh, they probably stopped for a minute and said, they're right over there, because the smoke cleared. So they started again, and they had another volley for about another 25 minutes. The final nail comes when Edward Patton Ham, the general in charge, rides out into the field and attempts to rally his troops. General Packenham is knocked off his horse. He gets on another horse. He's knocked off and dies about 15 minutes later. And with the general dead and just the 2,000 or so casualties lying out on the field, the decision is reached, retreat. And then it really calmed down. It was just like a volley here and there. And then the smoke cleared, and you got to see that the British were going the other way. And then there was a huzzah on our side. The U.S. won the battle because they had the superior position. They also knew the land, they knew what was here, they knew what the British had to do. And when it came right down to it, I think their motivation was higher. They were protecting their land. The British are 5,000 miles from home, and I think they're realizing that this isn't going to work. The Battle of New Orleans was the first time the world, and especially the British, recognized America as, as an independent country. But all of a sudden, the Americans were somebody in the world. Not uncommon for someone to identify themselves by their state, whereas after the War of 1812, they started identifying more as an American. The battlefield represents a diverse and intensely American experience. We have groups that speak four different languages that don't know each other, and they found a common goal. They started to feel like there was one nation. The Battle of New Orleans was a fight to control an internationally critical port city. And the War of 1812 reinforced the independence of the United States from Great Britain and proved to the world that it was becoming a global power. Today, the National Park Service protects the cultural and historical significance of the battle. And one of the ways that we do that is with historical weapons and black powder demonstrations. Hey, Sean, how's it going today? Going well, how about yourself? Yeah, pretty good. So what cannons did you bring out for us today? I brought out two cannons. The first, the one right here, is a reproduction of an 18-pound tube. The one just behind us is a six-pound tube. These are pretty representative of the size of cannons that were on the battle line. Uh, the Americans actually had 14 cannons spread out through eight batteries along the entire line. The British had slightly more cannons. They had 20 tubes altogether, but they didn't have the protection of the rampart, so that numerical advantage kind of gets negated. So what is black powder? Black powder is a, an older form of gunpowder. When it goes off, it makes a big boom and produces a lot of smoke. Modern gunpowder doesn't really produce nearly as much smoke. So what are the names and the purposes of these different tools? Okay, this first one is called the worm. Its job, you can see it's got a corkscrew on the end, is to basically grab any leftovers in the tube and pull them out. Uh, this could have been the sack that the gunpowder was put into. It could have been just any debris. This next tool is called a sponge. It's got wool on the head here. Its job is to soak up water. You shove it down the tube and it puts out any smoldering embers. The last implement we have is the ram, the rammer. And it's just basically a hunk of wood that's job is to force everything back to the end of the cannon so it'll go boom. Good ember. All right, good crew. Take aim. Fire.
No one is alive today who was here during the War of 1812 or the Battle of New Orleans. We can preserve some of that history through written documents, through oral histories, but by protecting the actual place where the battle happened, people have a physical place that they can come to visit and have a personal connection with. So thank you for joining us on our virtual Battle of New Orleans experience. I'm Ranger Kim, and we hope to see you here at the battlefield sometime soon. Too often people don't understand the effect of various battlefields, what the effect they had on the country. Just think of the bravery of people fighting for something that they value so much. The things that they went through for the adversities that they faced, for the trials that they suffered, it puts ours in a little bit of perspective. And so that we don't forget where we came from.